virtual reality, genetically modified humans even, or artificial intelligence that accompanies us every day in our Google searches, or for example, in aiding doctors in medical advice, since we're here at the Faculty of Medicine. And one reason why we might not realize this is that some of these things are still rare. I mean, I'm here in person right now, but I could just as well be presenting via hologram or via a remotely controlled robot. It's possible nowadays, but it's still rare. These technologies uh, are usually only used by the tech savvy or by the rich. Like the famous author William Gibson said, the future is already here, just not very evenly distributed. And this may be one reason why we rarely realize how advanced the world has become. Another reason is that we may have become accustomed to these technologies thanks to science fiction. We've all seen it before in a staff, before these things appeared in reality. So does it mean that science fiction has the power to predict the future? I wouldn't say so. Let's look at the moon landings. Before 1969, when they actually happened, lots of stories featured travel to the moon. Already in the med medieval Japan, the tale of the bamboo cover showed the story of a bamboo princess which came from the moon and then returned there on her chariot. Or the astronomer Johannes Kepler's novel Somnium also featured travel to the moon. But these stories and so many other ones have nothing realistic in them. They are similar to Marco Polo's tales of travel to the far east. It's mostly just imagination. To get some realistic portrayals of space travel, we have to go to the 20th century, after rocket pioneers such as Konstantin Tsiolkovsky already laid out the basics for actual space travel, and Tsiolkovsky even imagined how humans might one day live in space habitats and in microgravity. So the theory was already here, before it got into fiction. And afterwards came the application. So something similar can be seen in most cases. Let's take, for example, ubiquitous surveillance. It was shown in George Orwell's 1984, and we've gotten the technology to get this big brother only later. But even before that, in the French Revolution, Agents of Robespierre, without any advanced technology, were feared for their power of surveillance. So it was nothing new. Orwell just took it a bit further, and then it became reality, although he wouldn't probably be happy about it. And we might see something similar in most cases. So science fiction doesn't really seem to predict the future, but it can do something more important, I would argue. It can influence it, inspire it. If we return to space travel, look at these guys. Elon Musk and Jim Bezos. Both of them read science fiction when they were small children. And they both said that they were inspired by it to actually pursue the dream of space travel and make it real. They decided not to wait for national space agencies to get humans to Mars or return to the moon after the Apollo exploration has ended. They actually set out to achieve these goals themselves. And judging by the successes of their uh, companies SpaceX and Blue Origin, even if we disregard the recent Crew Dragon accident, uh, they are in a good way to actually achieve these dreams as private founders of these companies. And sometimes the inspiration is more direct. Here we see the first flip phone, one of the first mobile phones ever. And do you see similarity with Star Trek's communicator? I certainly do. And so did Motorola's engineers. They even named the phone Star Trek in honor of Star Trek as the inspiration source. And speaking of Star Trek, you're getting into uh, a bit further away 
how science fiction can inspire the future a more important way than just inspiring mobile phone design. Seeing this picture, we can probably uh, find nothing uh, out of the order with it, nothing peculiar. But in the 1960s, when the Star Trek original series was aired, this was a bit strange because we're seeing Captain Kirk and Lieutenant Uhura, both officers working on the bridge of a starship of the Enterprise. And it's the 60s. It's the age of rampant racism and gender discrimination. And here we have a black woman, an officer on the bridge of a starship, shown as capable, competent, intelligent, and more than capable of uh, facing the challenges that the crew uh, gets every day. So in this way, Star Trek was paving the way for a more just and equal future. And in one of the episodes, it even featured one of the first interracial kisses on TV between Captain Kirk and Lieutenant Uhura. And much later, in the 1980s and 90s, it all got a bit further with the next generation and Deep Space Nine. And it showed us uh, a future without money, but not communistic, as we would call it, but more like a post-scarcity society, where money is no longer needed, where science and technology and the pursuit of knowledge have enabled us to create a better future for everyone involved. And in Deep Space Nine, it then featured one of the first lesbian pieces on TV. So again, one more step for uh, a more equal social future. So science fiction uh, may be viewed as uh, the source of inspiration, not just for science and technology, where it can get people uh, to actually pursue STEM careers, but also in social change. But is it still doing this job, or is it past its prime? Because this famous science fiction author, Neil Stevenson, has argued in his uh, 2011 article, Innovation and Starvation, that science fiction is no longer creating these big popular images that stick in people's minds. He dubbed them hieroglyphs, and he cited the rocket, or the robot, or the atom, as examples of this. Hieroglyphs uh, tended to uh, stick in people's minds, and made them uh, more uh, prone to create uh, real examples of such things. And uh, science fiction uh, before the wars, showing us uh, space travel and uh, autonomous cars and other great technological advancements may have helped uh, the public's view of the Apollo program or other technological advancements that actually happen in reality. But in Stevenson's view, it has stopped doing this. And he said that you should return to this golden age, or rather make a new one, create new hieroglyphs for people to pursue. Later, an anthology, that hieroglyph, was created. But even some of authors concluded that it actually didn't achieve his dream. One of the authors, James Cambias, said that while the stories were all engaging and full of great technology and science, they didn't create new images such as the ones Stevenson had cited before. But he also said that it's not important, that it doesn't matter, because the actual power of science fiction is the indirect inspiration. It's the showing people that science and technology are cool, and that we can create a better future with science, with tech, or with social change, and that this uh, is more than sufficient. So, is that it? Is science fiction our indirect inspirational source? Right, and that's the end of it? Not really, because there can be a much greater possibility. Not only that science fiction doesn't create new hieroglyphs, but uh, that it may actually uh, draw us away 
from the pursuit of knowledge or from achieving these great goals because well, a lot of fiction shows us easy solutions. Just think of all the times you've seen in science fiction on TV or, or movies or when Earth was facing uh, an imminent threat, a great problem, and there was this one scientist who stepped in and saved the day in a matter of hours, days, or weeks at most. This is really unrealistic, but it tends to create this image of uh, a single scientist uh, saving the day and making everything better, while actual science is hard work, it's painstaking work that takes years and that takes uh, teams of dozens or hundreds of people, not one genius usually. And by showing us these easy solutions, uh, it may uh, make us less prone to do something about real threats nowadays. Because uh, why cycle instead of drive to work and uh, try to uh, cut our carbon emissions when in the future we can shield the earth from part of the sunlight or engineer better and climate or uh, when we can possibly achieve uh, nature-friendly fusion power in 50 years at most. And it doesn't matter that we have said 50 years ago that fusion power is 50 years in the future. And it's still 50 years in the future. But science fiction can create this type of thinking that we don't have to do anything. Technology will in the end save the day. So it might make us more oblivious instead of more hardworking in creating this kind of better future. And also, uh, a lot of science fiction uh, is this topic, showing us these catastrophic futures, totalitarian regimes, and so on. And instead of warning us against them, it may be making us accustomed to these images of a future we don't want. Just look at Orwell's 1984. It was a warning against totalitarian governments, against the rise of strongmen as leaders, against mass surveillance. And look at the present. Strongmen are rising politically in the US, here and in Hungary and many other countries. And mass surveillance is on the rise too. We're giving up our most intimate personal data. Uh, and we're getting easy access to the internet. Uh, we can share pictures on social media. We can even get our two minutes hate on social media if we want. So 1984 gave us the language to speak about this. Big Brother, Two Minutes Head, and so on, or Newspeak. Uh, it can remind us of uh, fake news and uh, such things, but it didn't uh, succeed in preventing this kind of future. So, what is the actual role of science fiction? Is it this kind of uh, higher way of creating panacea that uh, can make us achieve these great things, or is it indirect inspiration for scientists and engineers, or is it this just escapist fiction making us oblivious to the real world? Well, like most complex questions, there is no easy answer to this one. It depends on the type of fiction and, of course, on the type of reader. And we can never create a uh, just science fiction that is inspirational because we would be constraining the genre. Luckily, we still live in a free society and we can write and tweet whatever we want. But as readers and as authors, we can pick the type of fiction that can hopefully inspire us to pursue a better future. And as a biologist by study, and as a science fiction writer, I am directly inspired by science in creating science fiction stories. And when I read a new scientific paper, for example, on uh, the origin of song in zebra finches, 
or on booster emissions in distant galaxies. It often makes me create stories around these scientific facts, and then people may actually learn the facts while reading the fiction. And hopefully, I don't know this, but I can certainly hope, by reading this, they can think, wow, I want to do this too. I want to become a scientist because it's great, it's cool, I will be learning new things, I will be advancing humanity's knowledge and hopefully one day getting us to the stars. And we certainly need all people capable of adapting to the challenges of the future world and pursuing big dreams such as finding alien life. The European Space Agency is sending its ExoMars mission to Mars in just a few years, and NASA will send its 20, 20 Mars rover as well. And these will search for signs of life in the past or potentially in the present. We have learned that Mars is Mars waste. That means it's not geologically dead. It may have still some active hydrothermal vents or volcanoes where isolated conditions for life might potentially exist. And that's not the only place to search for life in the solar system. We have the icy moons, such as Jupiter's Europa or Saturn's Enceladus, which also feature in fiction from A.C. Clarke up until now. And these moons, underneath the thick icy crust, have subsurface water oceans that will likely have conditions for life. We don't know this yet, but we have to go there and we have to find out. And it's up to the next generation of scientists and engineers of space probes to achieve this. But it's also up to the public to support this dream, up to the policymakers and politicians to value learning, value knowledge, and to see how even going to the outer space can help us in battling the challenges here on Earth right now because uh, technology from space can help us uh, prevent more global warming or help poor people and we don't know yet where it will take us so we have to just keep advancing and see so this is my message don't ever lose your imagination if you like science fiction, go on reading it and please be inspired to create a better future because it's up to you. It's up to single one of us. Thank you.